This is Drom Shakasuto. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like this video. So I'm um, I'm doing the best I can to to hold myself back, but it's not my nature. Now the thing is that I know people are very fragile and it's kind of risky to 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 make a lot of noise, to make big changes. People are not always able to deal with the light. But um, but the real truth is that it's written Altim Natov Mi Be'alab that we're not allowed to hold back something good from his owners. So if there's something that we know like Torah, like wisdom of, of creation. So who owns that wisdom? No one. It belongs to everyone. It's, it's not mine. Let's say that I learned something. So for sure that immediately I, I'm obligated to teach that thing. It's not mine to enjoy from it. I must give it out. So when we're coming to deep understandings, not allowed to hold it back and to think to ourselves that it's that it's ours, that it's our wisdom or whatever. Now I many times in my life I saw that it was in my power to change nature in my prayers. I needed some things and I went and prayed for those things and really the Creator helped me and in a wonderful way I made Shinoya Teva change to the nature. Um, and, and you see that it's not only me, I experienced it myself so it helped me very much to understand that it it's really part of the creation, it's part of the way that you, in your power, hold this tool, you hold this tool, that you can change the, the settings of, of creation. Now, the Torah is full of stories, the Gemara, the, the, the Midrashim, stories from Tzadikim, righteous people. All the books are full with stories on people that change nature. Now, what is holding us back from believing in that ability, that in that potential of us, of ours, to change nature? Our low self-esteem. You read a story about that righteous man and you're idolizing him, you are sinning in a way. You are putting him in a different place than you. You say, no, look, he is something else and you're separating yourself from him instead of connecting yourself to him. Connection to the righteous ones, it's a faith that we should all have to believe that we are connected to the righteous ones and not disconnected from them. So if you say to yourself, no, Moses was able to do this and that, but me, I'm not Moses. So you disconnected yourself from him. Abraham, Hashem gave him, made him, made him able to walk in the fire. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Hashem helped them. Okay. And you're dividing yourself from those righteous ones that the real only reason, or at least the main reason, that they experienced and enjoyed those wonders was to teach the next generations of the essence of faith, of the power and greatness of our connection with the Creator. There is a story on, on a community um, that lived in, uh, in the Holy Land 200 years ago, 100, uh, in, uh, 100 years ago, something like that. And the, um, and the, the Ishmaelim, the Arabs that lived in Hebron in those days, were stopping 
the, the Jewish people from coming closer to, to Marat HaMachpelah, to the holy place over there, and to pray. And in one of the days, there was um, their, their sheikh, their, their leader or whatever, a minister, or important in their eyes, important to them, was walking and he dropped his sword. And the sword fell into that hole, into the pit, into the grave that is in, inside, of a, inside of, a, of a cave underground. And where, the, where our ancestors are buried. And immediately he commanded one of his soldiers, one of the Arabs, to go and to, and to bring his sword back. And he was terrified to do it, and no one dared to go down to this holy place where Adam and Eve and, and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rivka and Jacob and Leah are buried. He was terrified to, and the head of Esav is buried. And he was terrified to, to go over there, to go down to that holy place. But his commander commanded him to go and to bring that sword. So he didn't know what to do. And he was terrified and he finally went down because he knew that if he won't go, so he will execute him, he will be killed. And when he went down to that um, cave, so he died. And there was no other solution for them because the commander demand, the minister demand his sword and they, they had to find it to bring it and no one could go down to this holy place without dying. They were terrified. So they found that they, they, they got an idea. They took the Jewish community and they hold them and called them all and said, if you're not going to bring us the sword in three days, we're killing you all. And that's it. Like, okay, we found the solution, no problem. So now the Jews, they had to find the solution, how to bring out the sword. And everyone were terrified and no one knew what to do. And after three days, one of them had a dream that in that dream he had a vision. And in that vision he saw something. And the details are not important now. But then from that dream he came to the understanding that he has the, that ability to go down and to bring the sword. So he volunteered and he said, I'll do it. And they said, but you, you're going to die. He said, no, don't worry. I saw a verse, whatever, and, and, and I'm going to do it. And then he went down and took out the sword and, and, and went back. So, and there is a long story on how, on, on how and what happened. But, okay, now. We will say that only righteous ones are able to do But here, a person that had been handpicked by the public, a person that chose himself to go and volunteered to go, now, after that day, you will say, okay, you don't know who he was and how righteous he was and how pure he was. Okay, but again, we're using his glory to justify our weaknesses and to say, no, I'm not able to do that. In time of crisis, in a place that there is no one else to do the job for you, you must be the one to do the job. Or else 200 people will die. What are you going to do now? You won't do the job. You must do the job. You jump into the fire. And, and not because that Abram was Abram, he'd been saved. Because his faith was complete, he'd been saved. Not because that, that, that Moses was holy, so the sea been opened for him. Because he was a person that dedicated his life Every day, every moment of his life, he dedicated Nachshon Ben Aminadav, a crazy person, a lunatic that jumps into the water without paying attention to reality, ignoring reality, getting into the water with his shoes, with his pants, with his shirt, with his backpack, getting into the sea, water are covering him, and he volunteered to jump into the water. Now, the sea been open to him, to Nachshon ben Aminadav, not because that he was Nachshon ben Aminadav. Now we know that it was Nachshon ben Aminadav, and we're praising the name Nachshon ben Aminadav. But Nachshon ben Aminadav was Nachshon ben Aminadav. And he jumped into the water, and Hashem made a miracle to Nachshon ben Aminadav, not because he was Nachshon ben Aminadav, just because he jumped into the water while ignoring the fact that there's water over there and it's a huge risk and what will happen because that he was so crazy and jumped into the water so Hashem made a miracle to him 
And you can see those crazy situations with many of those righteous ones. Moses is climbing. Okay, Moses, don't idolize people. Moses, who was that Moses? Moses was a person that decided to go and fight with Hashem. That was Moses. You will say, no, he was higher than an angel. He climbed to those levels against the will of the angels. He was fighting. He was arguing. He was refusing to surrender. He was battling with the Creator Himself on the holy tablets. He is holding in one side and forcing the Creator to hand him the Bible, to hand him over the Torah. And Hashem didn't want it in the, in the beginning, in the first place. And they're arguing until it's written, Gavar kocho shel Moshe. Moshe's power overpowered Hashem's power. He was stronger than him. He took the Torah in force from Hashem. Now, how you do those things? If not by being crazy. If not by going all the way with, what, with, with your belief. With your belief. You need to go against all the stream. Dead fish are swimming with the stream down the river. They're dead. They're still swimming with the stream. Because they're dead. They can't move. A live fish is always in action. He's always in movement. Always looking and seeking and asking and wishing and hoping and desiring and moving. He's alive. You'll see him up the stream, down the stream, jumping, climbing, growing, moving, going down, jumping above the, the waves. Alive. Alive and exist. And the, the pulse is, is, is the blood is, is running in his veins. Why? Because he's alive. No, he's alive. So he's in movement. Now we cannot let ourselves die because other people are dead in, around us. If all the people in days of Holocaust, because of the dead people that were surrounding them in the camps, they would come to that conclusion that they should all die, so there would be no one left out from our nation, at least half of our nation would go down the drain. But people, even though that they saw thousands and millions of people dying in front of their eyes, their beloved ones, and still they decided against logic not to give up for no purpose, for no reason, only great despair, sadness, poverty, hunger, torture, nightmares, until today they can't sleep. Their children cannot sleep from the horrific stories and from, from the results of second and third and fourth generation. Until today, people cannot sleep because of the Holocaust. And still they chose to live against all logic. What is more natural than to, to let it go and uh, to give up? Also for us, in this crazy generation, no matter which direction you want to choose trying to serve Hashem, the road is blocked. The road is blocked. You try to learn Torah, you cannot focus. Every, ADD is a name. Everyone are ADD in this generation. Everyone. No one can focus. I don't know one person that is able to sit and, 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 and focus. No one. No one can focus. No one can learn. No one can put his mind into the learning. Everyone are suffering. Everyone are ignore, have to ignore things to focus. Have to be selfish to learn. Everyone are suffering. And if he will try to make up stories, no, me, I'm not, I am learning, I am holy. Okay, if I'll sit for five minutes with your wife, she will start crying for, for two weeks. You won't be able to relax her after admitting the uh, bitter truth of, of her sorrow, living separately from you, and that you're ignoring your feelings and ignoring your heart and can't feel her, can't understand her. She never told you, she never said, she never opened up. And on and on and on and on and on. And those are stories that are coming like waves in the sea, in hundreds and in thousands, every day. Every morning, new tests and new tests and new tests. So what, what should we do? We should understand that this is reality today. It's like that you wouldn't cry while running in the camps that you need to be, to be slavered for a piece of bread that you cannot even call it bread, you over there, you wouldn't cry that you, you haven't learned Dafayomi. 
You wouldn't think about Dafayomi. You, you would cry on not being able to learn at all. You would cry over there on not being able to eat kasher. You would cry over there for not being able to keep Shabbat and holidays. You wouldn't say, oh, I have a meeting at... at two. You no know, meetings. There's no meetings. It's all gone. <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> you, you're never going to see him again. Maybe in the world to come. He's dead. The meeting is off. He's canceled. He's dead. He's in the stoves already. Two years ago he died. No meetings. You're not late. There is nothing else except of holding on and surviving. This is what you do in the camp. You survive. So now we are in a place that in a way, in a crazy way, in a different world, is similar to the camps. It's all crazy. It's all wild. It's all noise. It's all a mess. It's all after shock and after trauma. Everyone are traumatized. No one can focus. No one can understand. No one can put his finger. Go ask a question. Go ask a rabbi. Okay, what should I do? He'll tell you do this. Go ask another rabbi. He'll tell you the opposite. Go ask a third one, a third opinion. Go ask the fourth. He will tell you I cannot say psak on that. Okay, so I'm lost. What do you want me to do? Lose my mind. I already lost my mind. I need to come back to myself. No, that's what Hashem wants from us in this generation. Hashem wants us to come back to reality, to come back to, to, to sanity. And there is no one in the world that is able to give you sanity, to, to, that is able to teach you. I sat with huge righteous people, and I'm not making up stories. I sat with big, big, big rabbis, and I argued with them, because that's me. From the moment that I realized that I'm holding a certain truth, it's Torah, and I must learn, I want to understand the truth, and I have questions, and I'm asking, I'm not scared to ask. And I went and I sat with big, big, important people, and I was arguing for the sake of Am Israel, for the sake of our purpose, for our goal. And I'm trying to ask, isn't it the right way that I should do this? Isn't it the right way that I should do that? Am I not supposed to go with that attitude, with that approach, with that understanding? Isn't that the real purpose of our life? Just asking and talking about the topics that I'm teaching, talking about those things that are in the peak of priority according to my understanding. Midot and unconditional love and caring about each other and loving each other and supporting each other and clearing time to sit with other people and even if it costs you with not learning and with not being able to do your own things and your own development and to drop so many important things for a different goal and for a different purpose and to care and to love and to support and to heal and to save lives of people and, and with those goals I went to go to, to, to talk with, with huge righteous people. And I must tell you that in the beginning I found myself in front of locked doors. Found myself arguing with people, huge and righteous ones, that were not able to listen to what I said. But from those big people, few of them, in the end of, 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 of our conversation, they came to a deeper understanding than the understanding that they had before. And they themselves admitted that they were wrong. For an example, I sat with one of the biggest Admorim, one of the biggest rabbis, and I spoke with him. And I told him, listen, I must tell you, you are an angel. There are no doubts on that topic at all. You are an angel, no doubts about it. I saw you praying, you are an angel. I saw how you're sitting with people, thousands of people are coming to you, you give time to everyone, you're patient with everyone, you love everyone, you can see it, you're an angel, you're a holy person, no doubt. I saw you praying, you're holding the Siddur and you're screaming your guts out, you're crying and you care and you love, no doubts about you. But I want to tell you that you're still in your position you have your own kingship. You are well respected by your students. Everyone admires you. No one is disrespecting you. You receive money from your students. You have your time that your house is locked and you can sit for hours in front of an open book. You can learn Gemara for hours. You can learn Shulchan Aruch. You can learn books of Hasidut. You have your own kingship. And then when you finish charging your batteries, you can go out like a lion and to work. And you make a fantastic work outside, no doubt about it. While learning, while davening, while meeting Am Israel, you're doing fantastic. But I think 
And I told him that you're not doing even 1% and not sacrificing even 1% from what that I'm sacrificing. And forgive me for saying that, and I'll tell you why. Because I don't have a moment to charge my battery and I'm throwing myself every moment for someone else in my life. If it's for my wife, if it's for my children, if it's for my students, if it's for, for random people in the street, I don't have a moment to charge my battery and I don't drop my work for a second. I'm not opening books and sitting and learning for hours. I don't have the, the, the funding and support that you have from your students. I don't have those bodyguards that are surrounding me. I cannot lock my door for four hours every day and sit and learn. I don't have that privilege and I'm still giving my guts and I'm sacrificing. I cannot go and do two weeks at Bodedut in the fields. I don't have that privilege. I don't have that ability. And he took his head down and with great humility he told me, I am not able to stand in your tests. There is no doubt. He said, from 630 degree, degrees, you are not receiving pleasure even in one, from one side, from one angle. You're not receiving pleasure in one angle from all of your surroundings. You're giving to everyone around you. Now I'm asking you, is it my greatness? It's not my greatness. It's not my greatness. It's my understanding that if you see someone that is drowning in the sea and you're sitting with an open book, so the Gemara is calling you a foolish person, a foolish Hasid, if you're going to continue reading while a person is drowning, no matter who he is, if he's Jewish or not Jewish, if he's a scholar or not a scholar, if he's dressed or not dressed, if it's a man or if it's a woman, if it's a... You, it's not important. A person now is drowning. Now, not to see that a person is drowning, it's to be blind. It's to ignore reality. Now, in reality, we have thousands and millions of people around us that are literally drowning. Every moment they are drowning. Every moment they are falling to sadness and to despair. And they cannot find a purpose for life. And they want to kill themselves. And they cannot find pleasure and joy and satisfaction from nothing in this world. And tell them, go and open a book. And they cannot find no answers over there in the books. They cannot understand. They cannot bring out the right conclusions. So what are you going to do with them? Say they're not worth it. Say they're not able to. They're not supposed to. They don't have the merit. They don't. What? How can you make yourself be better than them? Because they are learn because you had the, the ability to learn, because you had the power to sit and to learn, because you you had a certain privilege from heaven that they opened gates of wisdom to you that other people um, never experienced, never been exposed to. Is it making you better? Not to teach what that you learn makes you worse. Because you hold treasures that are not belongs to you. And it belongs to everyone, everyone allowed to know that Hashem is here, that they can call Hashem. Not only the ones that received it in tradition. There is a place for Baal Tshuva. Doors of Tshuva never been locked. Share Tshuva. We cannot be redeemed in no other way except of do, do, while doing Tshuva. And Israel Nigalin El Abi Tshuva. The only way for us to, to be redeemed is to, through Tshuva. If we're not going to teach people how to do tshuva, how can we expect redemption to come? And what does it mean to teach them to do tshuva? It's to wake them up to believe that they still have a chance. No matter how low they reached, how far they went, how dark they feel, how horrible, how, criticizing, uh, how much they're criticizing themselves, how much they hate themselves, all of those self-blamings are, are, are nonsense. If you want to guide a person in tshuva, you should un help him understand that no matter what he went through, no matter what he did until today, there is always a way back. But he will tell you, no, but you don't know my story. I'm laughing from that. It's a joke. No matter what. What can you tell me? What can you tell me? What can you tell me? Oh, wow. So what? But I've been with, I don't know what, what have you done? I killed a man. Okay, so now what? Move forward. 
did the worst in the world. Yes, you literally killed someone. What? So what? What can we do now? He's dead. Now what can we do? You killed a dead person already. You don't know that. But the Mishnah is already telling us and revealing, opening our eyes to know that that person that you killed, he was a dead man. You judge yourself because you killed him. And it's true. You should judge yourself on how you found yourself in that situation that you killed another person. True. You must judge yourself on that. You must check that you'll fix yourself in the roots that it will never going to happen to you again. Because from heaven they chose you and it was something wrong that happened to you to be that chosen one, to kill that person, to be that one above him, to kill him. But... Just for you to know, he was supposed to die anyway. With you, without you, if you wouldn't be the one, someone else would kill him. Because he was a dead person and death was a decree that had been decreed on him from heaven before you came to the world. There's no connection between you and him except of that the Creator chose to bring you both to that intersection in that moment, in that time, in that day and to make a combination. That he that was supposed to die will be killed by a person that's supposed to do tshuva on killing. And now the only thing that you can do is to try to fix yourself not to come to that situation again. And if you want to do something really great, go and teach other people. Go and save lives. You want to judge yourself that you killed that person and that person was about to get married and then he would have children and you might kill 20 people, 50 people. Okay, go and talk to young kids that are criminals that are hanging out in the streets, that they have knives in their pockets and going with guns or whatever and killing each other in the streets. Go sit with them, talk to their hearts, take the weapons and the anger from their hearts and from their hands and heal those souls. And by that, you're going to save the 50 people that you blame yourself on killing. That's a solution. That's a strong person. Now you did what, did you, was, what you were supposed to do. Can I judge myself on 20 years of being secular of my life? Can I judge myself on partying from age of 13? Can I judge myself on going to parties on Friday night since I was 14, 15? Going to clubs, to discotheques? Can I blame myself? Was there another option? I heard on Shabbat that it's something that you should keep when I was 19 years old. Before of that, Shabbat was a party time. That was Shabbat's purpose. We would go to the beach, we would drive to the sea, we would go make bonfires, we would party with the family, with friends when we were elders. We were not thinking about Shabbat. What was Shabbat? Shabbat was nothing. It was a free day. We wouldn't go to school and we could go and wake up late and eat whatever we want and no one is looking and then you can go and drive to the sea and then and in early, earlier ages can also smoke and do drugs. No one is caring when you come back home. You can come back late. You can drink, whatever. There are parties, driving. That was Shabbat. In our world back then, that was Shabbat. There was no other Shabbat except of that Shabbat. So now can I judge myself on not keeping Shabbat in those days? <laughs> you need to be very stupid to think that I am, can be blamed on not keeping those Shabbatot. How can you blame a person? Why didn't you come visit me? I just met you. No, but last week, why didn't you come? What do you mean? We just met. First time in our life. How can you? No, but now I'm upset. Last week I had a Shulem Zucher. You had to come to my Shulem Zucher. I just met you for the first time in my life and you're blaming me on not coming to your Shulem Zucher last week? Are you sick? Yes, he's sick. If he's blaming you on not coming to visit him one week before you met, you, he's sick. So for you to blame yourself on not being righteous in the level of your understanding today on how you're supposed to be today, it's to be sick. It's just to be sick and crazy and abusive about yourself. You're just killing yourself for no reason. How can you judge yourself while not being aware to the importance of, of Judaism, of mitzvot? Don't understand it. Now me, I'm not criticizing myself on those things. I'm just trying to improve myself as much as I can. 
just trying to give myself another reason why to work even harder, why to sacrifice myself even more, why to give another minute for my time, why to give another hour from my life, why to, to, to sacrifice myself in another aspect, in another way. And you can see from that pro pro progress, from, 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 from that way, that things are getting sharper and more precise and more right. You see that those advice are saving lives of people. People with no background, people with no connection and no tradition to Judaism at all, people with no connection at all, are finding my videos inspiring and you cannot understand why and how unless you drop all of your old thoughts, all of your old way of thinking and understanding that all people around the world, they have a spark in their hearts. And that's it. And now from that understanding that everyone is supposed to get a chance to come back to truth and to good, from that place you can grow and you can give life to people. And then people are waking up. And then people are waking up in ways that you're being inspired from them. You're in shock. You cannot believe. What? What are you talking about? How can it be? Communities in Africa are singing and dancing. Communities in South America are singing and dancing, ordering books and learning Torah and putting tefillin. And you say, what the heck? What's going on? How in the world? People are dying in car accidents and having clinical death and waking up to life. I must put tefillin. I must keep Shabbat. What's going on? We are ignoring the real spiritual aspect of life, the real spiritual side of life. That in reality, spirituality exists. In reality, you have a soul and we ignore it. And the religious world is also ignoring it. Even though talking about it all day long, Elokai Neshama Shenatata Biteora, Ta Etzarta, Ta Brata, we have Chelek Eloka Mimal, and saying verses, and reading Psalms of Tehilim, and whatever, mentioning and saying with their lips, but with the heart, not exist. No understanding to the souls, to the emotions, to the feelings of a, of a person. Yesterday night after a class in Woodmere, I met two friends. One of them is a Baal Tshuva, came from no background at all. No background, nothing at all. Like me, completely nothing. Didn't know, didn't hear, never crossed his mind. Nothing. And today he's talking about love to Hashem and he wants to connect himself to Hashem and he wants to do this and that and he's all passion and love to the Creator. His friend is looking at us and he's telling me, I don't know what to tell you. I grew up in a Litvish community in New York and all of what that I learned until today is that if I'm not going to do what my Rebbe told me, I'm going to be punished. That's what I know about Judaism. That's what I know. That I'm going to get it. That I'm going to be punished. That's what I know. He said, that is my, from here I need to grow. How, how do you want him to grow? How do you want him to grow? A secular person that never put feeling in his life got more potential to come closer to the Creator than a from super orthodox Jew that learned from age three in a yeshiva and he doesn't have a chance. He has a chance if he will work hard to break all of his old school assumption, all of his patterns that he grew up on, and to start bent those irons of, of, of crooked and bent education that he received back home. Because he was not taught the truth. Even if they read only from the Bible, even if they read only Gemarot and Mishnayot and Shulchan Aruch, and even if he finished Shas before he was 18, and even if he was saying the most inspiring Ali, um, uh, Drasha for the Bar Mitzvah, bringing Ran, Veritva, and Rif on, on all of his parasha, I don't know. Even if he did that, he still doesn't understand in the basics, that the Creator loves him in unconditional love. He cannot understand it. He needs to go on a journey to find out that the Creator loves him, that he can talk to his Father in Heaven. 
that there is love in this creation, that you can build and design your own life based on the nature of your creation, that you're allowed to live, that you're allowed to be who you are, and that you're not a robot or a droid or, or a pattern or, 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 an, or, 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 or a stamp of someone else, being forced to be someone you're not. The Creator made you and shaped you and designed you with qualities, with attributes, with talents, with abilities, with senses, with power. Now, you should ignore all of that and just functioning, corresponding to the orders. No. Kill yourself and that's it. It's not the will of Hashem. Hashem wouldn't make a world that is so colorful and so beautiful and so gorgeous that we all going to be the same. I advertised a picture of a panda bear and, close, and, 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 and also a picture of mine with sunglasses on Facebook and asked for people to comment, I asked what do you think? So someone said something very inspiring, she said from now on we're not going to say that Jewish Orthodox look like penguins, we're going to say that they look like panda bears. I think it's very wise. We should melt the ice a little bit. You can be who you are and to stay colorful. You can stay with your black and white and you can stay orthodox and you can keep all Torah mitzvot as much as you want. But to stay with your unique qualities and, and, and gifts that only as an individual you received from heaven. You are unique, you are different. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Akiva, they lived in the same generation. You're talking about two separate, different, completely people. Rabbi Yosef Karu and the Ari Kadosh, Rabbi Chaim Vital, they lived in the same generation, different people. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, same generation, learned one from each other, different people. One walks with grace, with kindness, one walks with power, with judgments, one goes with glory, with beauty. Everyone is going in a different aspect, everyone is running and serving the Creator with his own nature. One is singing to Hashem and one is decreeing and one is bringing out conclusions and arguing with Hashem while learning and one is going and saving people in the street. One is going and redeeming people with money and one is going and scamming and talking and convincing and, and kidnapping those souls back to Judah. Everyone is different. And if you're not going to allow yourself to be who you are, to go with your passion, with your understanding, your candle is off. You've been shut off by the system, by the government, by the yeshivish world. It doesn't matter who, they turned you off. And we're not allowed to let no one turn our flame off. Because Hashem wants you to be alive. That your heart will be a flaming fire of divine godly soul that is going and flaming the hearts of others. That you will go and inspire people. You don't need to be tall, you don't need to be uh, smart, you don't need to be clever, you don't need to be educated, you don't need to be a genius, you don't need to be rich. You just need to be honest and to go and do your thing. There was a heathen righteous man that he was a shoemaker, and there was a heathen righteous man that he was a, a, a builder, and there was a heathen righteous man that was measuring roads for the city hall of Tel Aviv. And there was a hidden, hidden righteous man that was a painter. And there were hidden righteous people that were sitting and learning Torah and Yeshiva all day long. There were really different righteous people in different ways. And, they, and, and not everyone are answering to the same qualifications. Not everyone are, 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 can be described the same. They were different. Daniel was different than Shimshon Agibor. Shimshon Agibor was different than Gidon. Gidon was different than Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet was different than Jeremiah, one of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was different than Ishayah. Ishayah was different than, than Yoshua. Yoshua was different than Moses. Moses was different than Aaron. Aaron was different than... Uh, and on and on and on. So now why you are an outsider? 
Why can't you be you and also go and throw yourself to Hashem and do whatever you want with your life? Why King David was able to sit with his violin and to play and you're not allowed to play? Why he was allowed to go and be a shepherd and play with his flute around the, the fields and you're not allowed, you're a bum because you're doing that? Why? Why? Why do you think neg in a negative way about yourself? You think that King David, while he was running in the desert, he was always with the Gemara and Tur Shulchan Aruch open? Are you crazy? You need to be or crazy or Litvish to think like that. Cannot be that you're going to think that King David, while running in the forest, hiding from his enemies that are trying to kill him, he's running and carrying his Gemara Masechet Betza while hiding. No, he was hiding for his life. He was running like crazy. He didn't want it to die. That's why he was screaming and crying to Hashem, save me, save me, I don't want to die, please rescue me, they're attacking me. Oh, you have time, you're casting Torah. If your rabbi in yeshiva would hear you that you're screaming to Hashem in Barach that you have enemies, he would kick you out of the yeshiva. Your breast level chassid, meshuga. No, maybe I'm King David. No, you're not King David, you're a breast level meshuga. Why? Here we're not talking to Hashem. Why? King David was talking to Hashem. Abraham established the morning prayer because he was waking up every morning to go and talk to Hashem. He was not davening Shmona Esra when he went to speak with Hashem in the morning. Only on Sheknesset Agdola, 1,000, 2,000 years later, established the, the, the written prayer. Abraham in the morning when he would come and speak to Hashem, he would spill his own guts to Hashem. He would cry on his troubles. Open Masechet Brachot, the funniest thing in the world, you won't believe. Tfilat Shmona Esra, the prayer that we were whispering and saying to Hashem in Barach, been established by the prayer of Chana, the mother of Shmuel Anavi. She is, from her prayer, that while she was praying, Eli, that he was the Kohen Gadol in that generation, suspected her to be drunk. He thought that she was drunk, and based on her prayer, while suspected to be drunk, she was praying from her heart. And she's praying over there a prayer, that every part of that prayer, from that prayer, they took out a conclusion and established a blessing. She blessed 18 blessings, she was praying on 18 things, from all of the things that she said over there, they established the 18 blessing that we're blessing today. Amazing, fantastic, great. Open Masechet Wachot, read their prayer, the prayers of Hannah, the mother of Shmuel Anavi. You won't understand how can it be. You won't understand. She's fighting, literally fighting with Hashem, threatening on Hashem, rebuking Hashem, screaming at Hashem, fighting. She's telling him, if you're not going to answer my request, I'm going to go and hide from my husband with another man. And when he will suspect me for hiding from him with another man, he will force me in court to drink from the bitter water. And it's a promise. You said that in the Torah, that if someone is suspecting a woman for something that she hasn't done, and she will drink the bitter water, and she never cheated her husband. So instead of dying from the bitter water, she will be conceived and I'll be pregnant. So, so she's threatening Hashem, telling Hashem, listen, if you're not going to make a miracle for me to make me pregnant from my husband, I'm going to hide myself. And then you're going to have to give me a child. What's that? She's asking Hashem in Masechet Brachot. She's asking, telling Hashem, Hashem, you made me in the shape of a woman that I have breast. And breast been created for me, women to, to feed babies. So why you created my breast if, you, if you're not planning to give me children? A question. A good question. Now, a woman today that will go and say that to Hashem, you're going to say she's crazy. But 2,000 years ago, the people of Knesset Agdola, they had eyes. They saw that she was not a breast lever meshugat, that she was not crazy, that just she was a broken, righteous woman that said the truth. And because that she was so honest and literally opened her heart to Hashem, she'd been answered. And then she'd been conceived and she received the prophet that was higher in his spiritual level than Moses and Aaron together, Shmuel Anavi. 
because of her honesty and that she went all the way with the truth, like Moses, like Elijah the prophet, like all the ancient ones, that they were able to go and to confront Hashem and to argue with Hashem. Hashem is telling to Abraham, I'm going to destroy this city. Abraham is going and fighting with him. No, but listen, maybe there are more people. Maybe you can say, no, there are no. Okay, so maybe for less. No, I'm not going to save the city. No, but maybe for less. Maybe you're going to find 10 people. No, there are no. He is arguing and arguing and arguing. He wants to cancel that decree. And even after Hashem is telling him, no, I'm killing them, what Abraham Avinu is doing? He's trying to save his cousin, trying to save his family. Never gives up. Hashem is telling to Moses, I'm about to kill them. Moses tells him, you should kill me first. You want to start? Kill me first. Those are verses, speeches of Moses. Hashem is telling him, I'm going to kill them all. Moses is telling him, so erase me from the book that you wrote. I don't want to be written in the Bible. What? I want to see this rabbi today that will say, if Hashem is not bringing redemption now, I don't want to have no part in the Bible. I don't want to have no share in the world to come. I want to see the chief rabbi of our generation that will stand like that and will speak like that, like Moses. If we would have Moses today, we would be redeemed. But we don't have. Why? Because everyone are in the yeshiva and everyone are making sure that their donors will donate monthly donations and that they will have their security and that they will have their, um, their, their houses, that they will have their properties. Everyone are making sure that for Judgment Day, the IRS won't catch them with their pants down. <laughs> People, instead of believing in Hashem, they believe in the IRS. Instead of believing in Judgment Day, they're afraid for the, the new secular year that will, will, will start in, in January. People are not, not, in, not, not connected to reality. And this is why Mashiach, Mashiach is coming. Okay, yes, there is no reception and he is stuck with ways. And then go look for him. Mashiach is coming. Where's Mashiach? How do you want Mashiach to come? What do you want Mashiach to do? Okay, Mashiach is here. Hi, I came. How, what's going on? What do you want me to do? What are you going to tell him? What do you want Mashiach to do? Now what? Mashiach, okay, go. What to do? No one is listening. Go talk to the people. No one cares. What are you going to tell people? People will hang up the phone onto the face of Mashiach. I'm asking you, Mashiach is coming now. We're talking about a Yemenite kid, 18 years old, that is coming from Gedera in Israel. It's Mashiach Tzidkenu. Welcome, Mashiach is in Boro Park. Now what? Oh no, Mashiach must be from Boro Park? Okay, Mashiach is a Hasid, Satmer, Hasid, what else you have? Which Hasid? Hasid Satmer is good enough, right? Mashiach is a 13 holy years child from Satmer's community, from, from um, uh, what's the name of Williamsburg. Williamsburg. He just ran out of Williamsburg coming to redeem the world. Okay, now he needs to go and to wake up everyone. He speaks only Yiddish. He doesn't know English. He doesn't know Hebrew. He cannot talk to no one. A Satmer, 13 years old, can communicate with someone today. Mashiach, he is holy, he is Mashiach. He doesn't know the language. He cannot speak. He doesn't have an access to the next door shul that is also Satmer. No, but you don't understand. It's a different Admol. It's a different Rebbe. He cannot go in there. It's a different world. He doesn't have an access to the next door shul. You don't understand the politics. I don't understand. You don't understand. You're locking Mashiach outside of your shul. Mashiach is Chabadnik. Mashiach is a Breslever. Mashiach is a Baal Tshuva. Mashiach is from from birth. Mashiach. No way. That's it. He's not accepted in our community. No matter who he is, he's not accepted. So okay, Mashiach is walking between us. You, he's, he, Mashiach is with us. Now what? He cannot talk to us. He doesn't have words to tell. What? We're not listening. You have to go home. He's got a meeting. He, for sure, he's very busy. That's it. What do you want Mashiach to do? 
Mashiach can go and, and ask for, uh, for uh, how you call it, Dmei Avtala, to, to receive money from the government. <laughs> he can open his shiva. <laughs> open a cheder. The doors of our heart are locked and blocked and sealed, and we're not opening them. You want Mashiach to come, you need to open your heart. You want the spirit of Mashiach to come and to enter into your life, you need to open the windows, you need to open the door of your heart. You need to become a real Baal Tshuva, you need to ask Hashem, Hashem, okay, you know what? Until today I was wrong. Hashem rebuked Abraham and told him, first thing, first from ten tests, He told him, you need to leave the house of your father and go to the unknown. You need to go to the land that I'm going to show you. Go to the unknown. Go. Lech lecha. Go find yourself. He was already so old and he was already so respected and everyone admired him. And he already kicked Nimrod that was the king in that generation of his throne of honor and he was so important and everyone respected him in his hometown he already established he opened his yeshiva already and then Hashem told him listen you should go find yourself Lech lecha. go look for yourself go find yourself in the desert you haven't started your process yet you need to go look for yourself go look find yourself your true self go Okay, where am I going? Go to the unknown. I'll show you. That's the way. That's the way. You want to know Hashem, you need to flow with Hashem. You need to flow with Hashem. Hashem is a wave. Hashem is a flaming fire. Hashem is the air. Hashem is the light. Hashem is the light. You're standing here and you're looking to the sky. Okay, this star is standing one billion years of light for me. So it will take one billion years to the light to come and shine from that star to my eyes. Okay, but I'm asking you for the light from the other side to the light. The light that went out from that star in the speed of light and just hit your eye. How much time it took for him? No time. From your side, it looks like a billion years. But for the light that is flying in the speed of light, there's no time. He's above time. That's the speed of light. It is above time. From your side, it looks like a billion years. But from his side, nothing happened. He just been exploded and just hit your eye. From your side, it looks like a billion years. From his side, he's flying in the speed of light. There's no time for him. He's shining in all the worlds. For us, 2,000 years of exile. Where is Mashiach? What are we going through? Wake up. Nothing happened. You can bring Mashiach now. We can bring Mashiach now. But we need to understand the potential. We don't turn on the switch. We're not drinking the water. We're not taking out the right conclusions from the books. You want to believe in Hashem? You really want to serve the Creator? You really want to be connected to the Creator? You must connect yourself to reality that you live in Wonderland, that the Creator can make wonders in your life, that the Creator can open the sea and the ocean for you in a second. No problems. No problem for Him to open the sea. He's shown you that He did it already. It's a joke. To bring a whale from the depths of the sea, to, to make wonders, to bring fire from the sky, to take out water from the stone, to open the sea, to kill all your enemies in a breath of a hand, in a moment. All those things already happened. Why they happened? To open your eyes, to recognize godliness, the true potential of our creation. And you will still going to whine and cry and complain and going to try to take a mortgage and to commit yourself on another loan and to make people sign for you for guarantees and on and why? Because you don't have faith. Because you don't throw yourself to Hashem. Throw yourself to the ocean. Throw yourself to the Red Sea. Throw yourself to the desert, into the unknown. Making music, dancing, talking, writing, composing, building, destroying, fighting, arguing, opening, closing, traveling. Why are you so scared? Why you let other people's thoughts to scare you and terrify you so much? Lotaguru mipne ish, the Creator is telling us. You're not allowed to be scared of no one. Of no one. 
You believe that there is a creator? Go do your job. Be committed to him in 1000%. Don't look back. But people are saying, people didn't say to King David, the ones that were arguing and fighting with King David, they were not rabbis, they were not righteous people, they were not known and famous and powerful in powerful position people. But when he was scared, he went to Hashem and screamed, Hashem, they are evil and they're blocking your way and they're blocking my way. And when Abraham was fighting, he was screaming to, to those people, you are blocking the light of Hashem. And Abraham, his slave, he is crowning himself to be the one that believes in Hashem, that is Hashem's slave, that is Hashem's messenger. Moses came back to Egypt after being 10 years out of Egypt. He's going and meeting Pharaoh and slapping his face that Pharaoh fell down to the ground. What are you doing? Are you crazy? One answer, clear, 100%, yes. Yes. Crazy for Hashem. Crazy. Crazy. Go now to the White House, slap the king, the pound, the, 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 the president. president. Go now to, to, to the kingship in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, go somewhere, prime minister, go slap his face, tell him, no, you're not going to talk about Hashem anymore. Crazy. What are Muslim crazy? The answer is clear. Yes. Yes. Crazy on Hashem. Crazy for the truth. Not benting for no one. People today are afraid of rabbis. People today are afraid of people in position of power. People today are afraid from police officers. People today are afraid of lawyers. People today are afraid of heads of communities. Oh, he's the head of the community that of, of, of in, in the mountains, in the Catskills Mountains. It's a joke. Like, so what? <laughs> Who is he? He can die tomorrow, like, what? No, he's the head of the community in the Catskills Mountain Camp. I don't know. What? Piece of junk, what are you talking about? You're afraid of people. You're afraid of your own shadows. You're afraid of your own, your, your, your sins. You're afraid of yourself. So what if he's a rabbi? So what is he rich? So what if he's rich? So what? You know, he's close to the governor. Oh, he's close to... So what? His brother is a lawyer. You're afraid of yourself. You don't have a drop of faith. If you would believe in Hashem, you wouldn't think those thoughts. You wouldn't trouble your mind for a second with people. You wouldn't think people. You wouldn't consider people's opinions and thoughts. You will do whatever you feel in your guts that Hashem is calling you and telling you to do. You would go and open doors, you would invite people, you would call, you would do, you would make, you would create. You would scream the voice that is being screamed from your soul, from within. You don't get it, huh? Okay, I'll see you next week, Hazrat Hashem. Thank you. Hazakabaruch. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, we hope you enjoyed this video very much. Please now remember to subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends to help spread faith in the world. For more, please visit amuna.com. May your light shine always and your requests should be answered with the greatest blessings. Amen.